The Ensemble podcast is intended for professional financial advisors. This content is created in partnership with our sponsor, MLC Limited, ABN 90 000 402, AFSL 230694, and is limited to publicly available information. Before acting on any general advice, you should consider whether appropriate and obtain financial advice from a qualified financial advisor. Ensemble does not hold an AFS license and does not provide any financial advice or services or endorse any general advice. If a PDS or IM exists, you should obtain a copy and review it thoroughly before making a decision. Hi, I'm Ryan Watson, CEO of Trebeca Financial, Australia's leading financial wellbeing advice firm. You're listening to a podcast series dedicated to exploring and understanding all things wellbeing through a financial advice lens. This is a special four-part mini-series from the Ensemble podcast. Over four episodes, we will talk with practitioners and wellbeing experts to understand financial wellbeing, what are its foundations, how can it be used in a personal sense, as well as taught as a practice to clients. Vivo is the award-winning health, wellness and recovery service from MLC Life Insurance. It supports people at every stage of life's journey, in sickness and in health. Vivo is available at no additional cost to MLC Life Insurance customers. And because we know advisors are the backbone of our industry, MLC Life Insurance offers some Vivo services for free to our partner advisors and their staff. To find out more, contact your distribution representative today. Morning, Tim. How are things with you? Good, Ryan. How are you? Good, good. For some reason, I feel like I've got deja vu, but, deja vu, but I, can't, I can't really work out why. Yes, it is true. Uh, we've done this before. We may have just done this before. Excited about today's episode. We're having a looking at well, but we're having a look at well-being, being a part of the advice practice, and what the offering looks like. But I think before we get into it, Tim, I'd love to hear a bit more about, um, and for the listeners, about your story to this day. What's what's been your advice journey to today? Yeah, cool. Well, I won't um, labour it because I've been on um, the Ensemble podcast before, but um, I've I came into financial advice in two thousand and nine, which was just after the GFC. Great time. Before that, I'd worked in retail and I'd been a buyer in retail. So it gave me a really good, uh, probably a dozen years working in retail and really looking at consumers' needs constantly every week with the stuff we were buying. And so it was it was very good training in the end to, to come into something like financial advice because that's really all we're doing. Uh, I sort of see it as setting up a a shop of services that the people trying to sell them services that they need. And um, look, I've been, I've loved financial advice. Um, I went into a, a practice and bought into a practice in 2009, stayed in that for about six years and then wanted to branch out and do my own thing. Um, a lot of what we're going to chat about today was probably the driver for that. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I've been in my own practice, Aspire Planning, since then. Oh, Fantastic. Now, given that you've mentioned it, what were those drivers for change and to take the leap to do your own thing? Yeah, look, I, I think I got a great grounding in those first five or six years in that other business, uh, getting my head around financial advice and, and how it worked, um, understanding the compliance needs and all that sort of thing. But I, I could really see that uh, people needed more than what, well, I felt people needed more than what that compliance-driven version of financial advice delivered, mm-hmm. and and I wanted to give them more, um, and provide that providing that context of what the financial advice is for, trying to help them develop more of a, a life vision that really drove would could be the driver for the financial plan itself. Okay, and so how long ago was that you started your own business, Jenny? Uh, twenty fifteen. Okay. In fact, it's probably pretty close to around this time of year. I reckon uh, I left on the first of August, so okay. Um, yeah, it, it's probably coming up for eight years. Yeah. So at the time, being eight years ago, it seems like somewhat revolution that you're thinking a lot, a lot more than just superannuation and risk insurance, just product. You, the operative word I heard that was life, and then vision. Yeah. Uh, Big piece to add into, you know, I know it's 
it's obviously more prevalent these days, and that's why you and I are having this conversation. Yeah. Um, but yeah, eight years ago, mate. Yeah, well, I think I just had the sense that the, I guess the driver for me, I did actually go and get some life coaching, uh, business coaching. I think I signed up for business coaching. Uh, it was a nice, friendly label. It was really life coaching. Prior to leaving that business, because I, I I just was a, at a bit of a stalemate there, and some of the tools that I learned from that uh, was with a lady by the name of Shanna Kennedy, who's written a lot of books um, around well-being and simplifying your life and and focusing on things that are important. Going through that process with her and and for her helping me get that clarity just made me s- s- sort of say, well, I could do this for my own clients. Mm. Um, or add a version of it, you know, um, probably not to the same degree that she can, but um, at least add a version of it that could then enhance their experience. So to that point around you having gone through your own version of coaching, Tim, how, how important is it this piece around we practice what we preach? Yeah, well, I, I, I think it's got to be absolutely vital because it's actually, in, and even to the point of, if we're going to sit in a room with people and and really espouse and help lead them, help inspire them to live a calm, deliberate, a focused life, we've got to be that ourselves. You know, we're, this it's a bit like you know, going to the the personal trainer who's twenty kilos overweight. You're sort of going to when the grind really comes on and you're sweating, you're going to be looking at them going, "Well, tell me to work harder," but I'm not really buying it from you. Well, there's that, there's that obviously buy it or that believability factor. But I think also having already tread the path, you can cre- there's true authenticity and there's vulnerability in that as well because it's easy to put yourself in their shoes and allow yourself to be affected by it. Yeah, I, and I think that's the important part. You mentioned that vulnerability. We're all, as financial advisors, I think we're problem solvers. So it's easy for us to jump straight in and, and be the the problem solver and, and put up a solution. And sometimes that might come across to, to people as, gee, these guys are, are perfect specimens. You know, they just know everything about everything. And I, th- I think it's really important to illustrate or tell stories about your own struggles and or that when you've needed to get advice or coaching or any of your experiences. So I think it helps people to say, okay, well, you know, maybe I can go on this journey too. I just want to pick you up on that point. Tim, about potentially advisors, especially when they're learning or in their early years, having thinking that they always have to be the problem solver or the solutionist. I think every person or every advice professional who's been on this journey thinks they have to do that. But what insights would you have around that for those younger advisors or aspiring advisors that are listening? Yeah, well, I think it's okay to say that you don't have the knowledge on anything, really. Look, we've all got heap of knowledge. A great point that someone said to me once when I, I think I was actually saying early on in financial advice, you know, I'll just get a bit stressed in a meeting if I don't know something. And it was an older gentleman said, whatever you don't know at any stage, you know a heap more than the person sitting opposite you. So I think that it's okay. It's okay to say, look, I've got some pretty good knowledge in that area. But um, I wouldn't, yeah. You know, I want to really check up on the detail around that and make sure I've got up to date knowledge before I give you a final answer. Or if if it's really out of your sphere, and this is what we've probably made a big point of doing this in our business, is um, collaborating with groups for common problems. So you know, if it's estate planning, or if it's aged care, or if it's Centrelink. Uh, where there's real expertise needed that you just are not going to be able to fulfill, have have a go-to person that you can recommend. Yeah. A couple of points as well, um, and I'm conscious, you know, when I was a practicing advisor, what I really loved was I could give you a 95% answer, but what about I go away, confirm it, I come back and give you 110%. Yeah. I, I think you can build real trust with clients, even that, uh, you know, demonstrating that as well. And the other part as well is I think... Some of the greatest growth for clients is not providing the solution or being the problem solver. It's actually the listening piece and enabling or allowing them to have the light bulb moment, depending where it is yeah. in terms of that conversation as well. 
but that could be really uncomfortable for an advisor too, can't it? Well, yeah, that's right. I, I think um, it's. I was having a, a chat with someone recently about this. Uh, it's something that we've really tried to do this year, particularly with uh, such volatility and interest rate rises and mortgage pressure. Um, investments are down, all that sort of thing. And similar when you get something on a repetitive basis like that with people coming in with the same concerns, I think we can tend to go into solution mode straight away. And so myself and Leandro, our advisor, uh, we, we made the point this year to make sure we sat in that emotion with the client. So first of all, encourage them to share their emotions about how they're feeling. Uh, you'd be amazed what comes back. And then rather than then justifying why they shouldn't have that emotion, actually, you know, validate it and even ask them what's your greatest fear about this, what's going on. And then maybe once all that's out on the table, then let's just talk about maybe why they don't have to panic that much and, and why this might just be a cycle or, or whatever. But I think the fact that you're then talking about it together rather than them feeling like, you know, my greatest fear in that situation is someone feels like they don't even want to share their emotion because if they, it's like, oh, Tim's just going to tell me I'm being foolish. That that would be a really a bad situation. I, I wouldn't want that with a client. You know, really want them to be able to come in and you're their confident, you know, share how they're feeling, share where they're at, and let's send them back out out there with a bit more of a renewed confidence. And that's, for mine, that's that real well-being piece, Tim, that security and that freedom of choice. At the end of the day, we're all human and our connection is built off the back of our imperfection, right? So and if an advisor is leading that conversation and sitting in more of that uncomfortable space, we see here as well at Tribeck, that's where the real breakthrough is. That's where the real trust, that's where, yeah. the, impl- that's where the implicit goals and needs come out. Potentially partners or couples get back on the same page. The amount of time we hear I've never heard you say that before. I didn't know that was important. And that's where you know you're getting somewhere, right? Yeah, I agree. I think, um, well, if we if we were to, you and I, sit here right now and say, out of the two these two factors, having the right structures or having the right behaviours, which one of those would you choose for your clients first? Yeah. It's a, yeah. Um, and, and it's the behaviours. And I think, you know, stress, volatility, uncertainty, to, if they're going through a bad time in their life, that's when if they if they've had behaviours that haven't supported their financial position before, and they might have some bad habits or whatever, and that's where you know you can add the most value is to help help them stay on track. Oh, I've got a great. Um, can I go off on t- a tangent for one? That's thing? what we. I love it, it's, Tim. Go for it. It's a great. Um, it's a great quote. Uh, it's out of a, probably one of my favourite books called Icky Guy. Um, written by um, a guy called Hector Garcia. And the, in there, now they mention about the word resilience. Mm-hmm. And we often, I think, think of resilience as the ability just to keep um, you know, laboring on through stressful times or whatever. But what they mention about resilience is uh, the people that are resilient are just people who know how to stay focused on their objectives. They're exactly. clear about what their objectives are, and they don't give in to distraction and they can stay focused on what matters, control what you can control and don't worry about what you can't. And so I, I, I like the simplicity of that because in some ways this is where we can play the role to say, look, there's things we can't control here, but there's some things we can. So let's stay fo- to help us stay focused on what we're doing. Let's work on those things that we can control. So I love what you're saying there around being clear on your objectives and staying focused because I think all too often people can perceive that money is in charge of them or that things are happening to them and there can be a bit of this blame mindset uh, without judgment from me in that. But the opportunity working with someone like you for clients to get clear on their objectives and they're specific to them and they have an emotional attachment to them and their ability to stay focused on them, they're then put in charge, they're in the driver's seat and they've got this real growth mindset around, you know, what they can change or improve. Yeah, that's right. And I think when when things really become hard for them or, you know, like any of us, when, you know, that old sort of, you played a lot of footy, uh, Ryan, I think, 
Yeah, the, the old yeah. go back to basics, go back to the fundamentals. You know, yeah. when things get tough, when we're not doing well, um, or we're up against it, just go do do the basics well. And I think if if you can do those and they're aligned to your objectives, then yeah, you know, things well, aren't quite as bad as what we think at times. No, no. And especially if they're your objectives, you know, without casting opinion or aspersion in a society that's pushing all this information to us, um, that's about money and what how they define success, the ability to work with a trusted person like you to get clear about what your goals and objectives are, there's, that's yeah. the real gold. You're running your own race, right? Yeah, that's right. Well, I mean, it's interesting you mentioned that because I think that um, when we look at the media and what gets pushed out at times, and maybe even from ourselves, is we're tempted to click on something that says, you know, the five, one of the things I'm not really rep for is life, you know, life hacks. You know, they call them hacks. Five quick tips that uh, just to make me feel good today that I've got those five lined up. It's like they're pretty normally at best one percenters. And if we can go back to the fundamentals, we could probably nail 80% just by doing the basics. So, mm-hmm. you know, you, you sort of think, well, the life hacks might be nice, but maybe if you it work on your basics uh, is a good place to start. So I think that's got a lot more, it's more solid for people that can feel really grounded. Yeah. And so further to that, Tim, could you give the listener an insight into what your engagement process looks like? with the new clients and what tools that you work through to help them get aligned around that 80 or 90% and not aiming just for the 1%. Yeah, cool. Uh, well, from a client, new client coming into us, uh, we, we use the Astute Wheel system. <clears throat> well, we've got, a, we've got a nice, I guess, a flyer that we send them when they make an appointment, when they're about to make an appointment that talks about our philosophy on financial advice and, and it really positions financial advice as the support act to that life vision. Um, so, you know, we really want to get that out straight away because we know that there's going to be clients who, who nothing wrong with that. They might have that value of, uh, I want to make a heap of money. I'm not really into this life stuff. We probably want them to realize we're not, may not be for them. Yeah. That's their values because we're not set up to, to serve them. And, but well, there is a lot of people out there when we when we speak about our philosophy that say, look, I don't aspire to be wealthy, but I aspire to be wealthy enough to do really what's important to me. Mm. And this is the interesting follow-up question that you get, because how many people really know, have articulated what I just said, what's really important to them? Because they, they do want that, yeah. but they haven't, in a lot of cases, they've got a, a loose vision. Uh, vague vision, but it's in some ways it's about getting a, a real articulated, detailed vision on, on it. Even if that vision evolves, that's fine. It's not locked in stone. Let's get it down on paper and actually really shoot for it. So that requires them to have that that courage to say, "Yeah, I'm going to do that." So look, we give them that when they do come in for a meeting. We've we've got a series of things that they've got to complete for us. One of those is a five, what we call a five-minute financial health check. That's a great thing that uh, Stuart Wheel has. It, ra- they rate themselves on how they're feeling in six areas of their finances. And I, that's even just a great starting point because you'll have, if it's all green, that means they're very comfortable. And if it's red, uh, they're very uncomfortable. So quite often they fill that out in a dramatic way, I find, which is... <clears throat> Where they're really feeling stressed, they score that down heavily. Where they're feeling sort of not too bad, the reality might might be more in the middle of that. But it's a great starting point to go. Well, it's pretty clear what where, how you're feeling, and so it's just to get set out on the table straight away to talk about that. Um, we make a big deal of going through those goals, you know, as much as we can in that first meeting. Mm-hmm. And when we we would send them a quote at the end of that. We send them a, um, a proposal, letter of engagement. We will send that back with what we heard on those life goals. We will write them up pretty in a pretty detailed manner. Um, in in their takes, words, Tim, as best you can, in their words? Yeah, well, the nice thing about that system is it's it's got their a section for their words and a section for our words. So okay. we can say what we heard them say, 
And then in our words, we can say what we think we can do to help them with that. So when they're reading it back as a proposal, they're saying, yeah, well, I did say that. And that's right. They said they could do these things. So we'd also challenge them back to say, look, if, if we've got any of these wrong or need to be refined, just let us know. Um, but I think what it does is says, look, we're taking these goals seriously. We've actually put work into your goals already. Mm. You haven't a, a committed to spend one cent with us. So um, I feel like we're sending a a clear message that if you sign up, you need to come ready to, we're going to go after these goals. Yeah. Um, so, you know, they've got to really buy into it. And that, yeah. that's why we've had people, you know, other advisors that have said, oh, gee, you put a lot of work in before you even get any commitment. And it's like, yeah, well, we do. Because I think we we equally, if people aren't up for it, they, they take themselves out and, and it's better for them not to proceed. And it's better for us that they don't proceed. Yeah, it's, it's a good filtering process as I hear yep. it and I, I understand it because, you know, I'm, I'm, I think there are sometimes there are some analogies or similarities between advice and say like a personal trainer, right? So even people engaging with an advisor, there is some hard work for them to do um, because we can't always be there and they, at the end of the day, need to help execute the strategy. So what I'm hearing, you know, you're helping we do the wrong term, but your understanding what people's commitment level is because this is a journey, right? Yeah, and I think as well, you know, like we probably have to put ourselves in their shoes at times and it's probably not that exciting for us. We probably do 100 SOAs a year. We've seen goals written up many times. For a lot of people, they've never seen their financial position presented back to them. Mm. They've never actually seen their these chunks, chunky goals that they've just told us about yeah. reflected back to them like this. So I feel like, it can be exciting for them. Oh, sorry to interrupt him. I love that point. So I think given that we do this day in, day out in advice, we don't often appreciate or put ourselves in the client's shoes when they're coming in for a discovery appointment or a mm-hmm. first appointment. There can be real emotion with money. It could be like their version of going to the dentist. I think, oh, I, think, I, think you know, I know we all do a pre-call or a 15. I think it often gets missed. What's yeah. the journey like for people coming in? If it's a partnered couple, what conversations have they had? And by starting, you know, couple, you know, starting with more of the qualitative side, but yeah, you know, I, I don't, I don't want people listening to forget that what that experience can be like, and because we know what to expect, how do yeah. they? Yeah, that's right. Oh, look, I, I think there's a big part of that. I think one of the things that we've tried to do, and I think it's for this well-being aspect for our client, is you know, we would all have this, especially more experienced advisors. If someone probably within half an hour, you, you can you'd already know what you're going to do with them. Probably, <laughs> you, you can see that. Now you could in your head, you could walk them around the bases very quickly. But I think for their for them to get back to home base and feel really empowered and understand and articulate what they've done and why they they've done it and what it means to their future, if we can take them around those bases slowly and deliberately. You know, when they get to that home base, they're in a much better position. That And that's more of that coaching aspect comes through, mm. isn't it, Tim? Because it's their journey. You're there to help facilitate that and for them to have those penny drop or those light bulb moments. Yeah. Therefore, they really own it and they grow from that as opposed to just being told. That's right. And I think, you know, we're, we would both uh, be in this boat, I think, Ryan, where we're trying to challenge ourselves on the client experience, because that is the difference between a client experience and just providing a solution. Yep. You know, when at home base there, they've, they've got the same solution in both cases. Yep. But in the client experience version, they've, they've enjoyed it. They've invested themselves into it. They've got a heap out of it and they understand what they're doing and why they're doing it, which gives them a heap of confidence going out into the world to, to try and achieve it. And that's the key, Pete. You know, you've taken them on a journey to grow and mm. that C word confidence you know you see in any walk of personal professional life people who have confidence can often achieve a lot of things yeah but our job to to get them there and to I suppose to build those tools so they can generate that confidence as an outcome and then they're almost unstoppable you know in charge of their money in charge of their life in charge of what they want and I'll be a lot happier let's be honest and that's a key piece to what a lot happier absolutely a lot happier because it's it's about they they're, they're driving the growth and they've they're chasing the things that are going to mean something to them. 
did. Um, and look, if we were to think about designing a, a business with our perfect clients and you had the perfect number of clients that you want and that if you could design that client, would you prefer to have a client that isn't sure what they want to do and is always deferring to you or someone that's totally inspired, got a long list of things they want to achieve and they're just saying, come and help me do this. I mean, of course it, it, we're going to want that that second client. And the second the second client as well, they're the ones that won't cancel an appointment or reschedule an appointment or they're the ones that will execute the strategy. Yeah. They're also the ones that will be your best advocate, which we know greatest success of engaging a new client for us here at Tribeca anyway, is from an existing client and the value that they've seen. Yep. Best piece of marketing in inverted commas we could ever do. Exactly. And I think the best advocate is just going to be in the way they're living their life. Mm. Yes. And, you know, their mates, I mean, we've all got mates who, who seem to, you know, it's like, but you really got things together. You yeah. feel, you seem really balanced and all that sort of thing. And you're successful in what you're doing. And what's your, what's your secret? Yeah, you know, and and you might be part of that 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 team that's helped help put them together. Yeah, and in terms of, I know purpose gets thrown around a lot these days, Tim. But in terms of bringing purpose back to your job or what you choose to do on a day to day basis, what a fulfilling job, right? And I think largely it's why everyone got into advice because they want to help. Yeah, exactly right. Um, and so it's look, it's it requires for us, I think, to you know, it's not to downplay our, our financial skills, not to downplay what we do financially, because that is really our key and plank, if you like. Yeah. But it's to start adding adding those other skills around around that and and starting to have more, as you said, vulnerable discussions and, and yeah. inviting that, inviting that into the meetings. And you've been... got a great framework that you use to do that, don't you? Yeah, we do. We we really enjoy that goals based conversation and in around the four, what we call uh, the four L's. So live, love, learn, and legacy. Um, mm. Yeah, we're in really enjoyable experience when you see clients buy into that, uh, especially partner couples. Obviously, we're not relationship counselors or anything like that. But when you see them, as I said earlier, when you see them get back on the same page, or in fact, I've never heard you say that or that that's something you wanted to yeah. do. And that's when the real work can be done because. Clients come and see an advisor, and all this, all the research says that expertise is implied. You know, they they believe they know you know what you're doing, and we'll we talk about we'll do, we do the doing. The doing is you know your cash flow and your investment contingency, so your insurance, and then we'll refer to your estate planning. But the real gold is in the building trust with clients and helping them understand those implicit needs. What's really important to them, the Joneses can do what, or the Kardashians can do what they do. <laughs> That's right. um, as we've said on a previous podcast with Amy, actually, um, so it's about what do you know? What do the Watsons in this instance want to do, or what do the Henrys want to do? Yeah, I, look, I think um, that becomes so important because I think if you're absolutely happy with what you're seeking to achieve, um, you don't need anything else, to really, do you? <laughs> no, no, you, no, you don't. Um, no, not at all. Uh, um, one of the things that we have done. Um, and we did do right from the start when I started the business eight years ago is we, um, started this thing we call the dream catcher. Okay. Uh, it's a little program. It's sort of evolved over the years. And, um, we look, I, when I, when I started Aspire and I told, I went and got some marketing help on it and I told them, this is what I want the business to stand for. It's life first, you know, the finances are the support act. It was really cool because the the two ladies that ran that marketing company, they they were excited about this. So you know, this is sort of, this is what will, it will help us understand financial advice. Now, this is what it should be. Yeah, and should so, we but, should, should we give them a free plug tip? <laughs> they're not still in business. Okay, oh, right, <laughs> I would, okay. I would, but they're not still in business. They okay. they sort of went um, separated and then went went their own way. Um, yeah, so they um, they were into it, and they said we could have this little booklet and and all that, and um, that's that evolved into what we call the dream catcher. But all the, all the booklet does is it creates this life vision. It's about six or seven pages, and it's sort of like a, a roadmap that they can go back to and say I often say to people, look, in the depths of winter in Melbourne when the weather's terrible and you haven't had had enough sunlight, 
you haven't had a holiday for a while and you're feeling a bit flat, just get, get your dream catcher booklet out and, and you know, sometimes it just uh, helps us say, look, yeah, we're on track for these things. So, um, yeah, it had areas of, you know, their main goals, their health and well-being, vision for themselves, you know, bucket list items, things they wanted to achieve with their kids or uh, holidays that they might want to do and that sort of thing. And then how they're going to sort of, I guess, break up their financials to do that, but didn't really have a lot of financials in there. So, uh, so we do that. Um, we had the booklet and we didn't really know how to help them get these, fill the book. I met a great lady from a company called Well and You, uh, Amanda McMillan, and, and I showed her the booklet. And she said we could do a little two-hour program, two-hour session mm-hmm. designed to help people create their intentions. And she said, once they do that, they'll come into your office with that booklet filled. And, uh, you know, I have to say I was pretty sceptical yeah. when she said that. Uh, but it, it really worked out that she was she she does this for a living. So she had a, a fantastic way to... Have the couple, we had the couples in the room, maybe about 10 to 12 people, five or six couples or some single people as well. And they had to actually do a lot of, a few exercises around talking to each other and writing a little for two minutes on something that was important to them, um, things that stressed them out. And then they'd have to go and tell one, another person in the room about that just for two minutes. Um, they kept the couples apart from each other through throughout that and then... You know, by the end of the thing, you you sort of write this uh, little segment around the wheel about all the things that are important to you in your life, and then you sit back with your partner and you compare notes. So the literal version of getting on the same page. And yeah. we've, there's been some really cool moments in there. Some of the more memorable things that I remember is uh, yeah, one couple actually, I think it was the, the, the wife messaged me saying, we actually left holding hands <laughs> we left the session holding hands because we were just so happy we were on the same page and we had young kids at the time and we were on the same page and it just gave us the inspiration to go you know we, let's go out and do this um and so it was that was all you need as a financial advisor to go they've now got that inspiration we're here to help them build it financially and away they go and it's just sitting in that tim how cool how cool is that it's not Oh, not a PDS or it's not a return, but that, you know, it is a gift, right? Because you chose, like you said, you're pretty skeptical coming into it, but you still chose to be brave and try it, right? And I think yeah. that's what this well-being piece is all about. It's um, try educated, oh, in an educated way, trying new things. Yeah. What's the best yeah. thing that could happen and what's the worst thing? And I think the downside is always generally a lot smaller than the upside potentially is. Like you talk about this couples uh, scenario. Yeah, exactly. And I think if we think about all the things that do worry us as advisors, and you mentioned returns there, someone that's got that vision is never going to talk to you about returns because we're on a long, we're on a marathon here with them. We're on a long journey, ups and downs, volatility, whatever. That this sort of insignificant to the bigger yeah. picture. Yeah. And if we talked earlier about, you know, financial well-being and how we define it at Tribeca is around security and freedom of choice. Now, if they don't have that in the daily or that takes a return or looking at the markets daily or weekly, then we probably need to go back to the drawing board in terms of the relationship with them and yeah. maybe re- re-explore those goals and the like. Yeah. So, you know, I sort of think, well, if so, if we've got a life vision that um, really means something to us, if that's if you've created that yourself and invested your own time into it, you've done it with your partner, it gives you something to shoot for. When we go back to that resilience discussion about people who are resilient know how to stay focused on what's important to them, there's there it is. It's in the book. So when you know when the skids happen or when whatever or something bad happens or you're not feeling great or you because go, because go back gets, to your basics. Yeah. Because life gets hard, right? I think that's right. You know, you talked earlier about the hacks and the one percent. That's not life. That's a sugar hit. Right. But it is. preparing our clients that there will be ups and downs, and life gets hard. This is what's going to help you get through that. You know, like you said, yeah. Um, the focus, yeah, the focus and the objectives. Yeah, exactly. And I think uh, we did this. Did say this um, in our deja vu session is um, <laughs> the. Uh, the debt, well, I'll call it a downside, maybe it wasn't a downside, 
Yeah. Um, the other hot side of the coin on on clients that have come through is that we did have one client who said going through the process actually was the starting point for their divorce. So, so there's the, the vulnerability piece as well. That say, well, she actually was. She told me that a year later after yeah. they and I knew they were getting divorced. Um, she said, "Look, I just want to let you know it was the dream catch session that was probably." The, the one it wasn't the cause of course but it was like a real uh exposed a lot of things mm-hmm. sitting in that session together how far apart they were and so look in the end that's been great for her that she's done that but um it just goes to show the power of uh what a session like that could do and you know i probably underestimated amanda when she said you know, i could put this session on for two hours and and it will really have a deeper meaning for people. You sort of yeah. think, gee, two, two hours, not very long. Yeah. Um, but there you go. There's two examples of where it really did um, make a huge difference in people's lives. And I think for us, you know, we don't necessarily have those skills naturally. So it's about also having the courage to co- collaborate with the right people. Sometimes you might they might be the wrong people and you've got to move on and find the right people. But it's about staying true to what you're trying to achieve with your clients and finding people that can help you with that solution. Well, it goes back to that earlier conversation, doesn't it, Tim? You know, not worrying about what you don't know. You know, the confidence to yeah. collaborate and focus on what you do know, but also what your passion is um, and how you want it, how you define and how you yeah. want to value to your clients' lives. Exactly. And, and I think be prepared to... You know, you've used it a few times, the vulnerability, because I, I would say we, we've done that session now every year, at least once a year. Um, even through COVID, we did it some um, online versions. And I would say as the person that's coordinated it and put it on and brought people, our clients into the room, every time that I'm sitting there, I'm going, is this going to work today? Even though I know that it's worked in the past, yeah. you, you've got that feeling of like, what if everyone thinks this is stupid? What if everyone, if there's people in here who think it's like, ah, oh, it's really wishy-washy, I'm not into it. And, you know, you really start having that moment of doubting yourself every time. Um, so it's just normal. Yeah. It's what I call the safe or brave moment. And everyone goes through it. No matter yeah. how much we look like we've got our SH1T together, everyone goes through that moment. It's the willingness to be brave and stay, stay the course, you know, yeah, and I think, I think in that instance, um, I couldn't agree more with that. And as an advisor, and if there's younger advisors listening, it's in that moment that the client looks to, you know, their commitment to anything I feel is going to be driven by uh, or, or measured by your commitment. So that's the moment, unfortunately, whereas if you back off that commitment and they're going to pick up on that. So you've got to really double down and go, we're going into this, <laughs> yeah. Uh, head full steam ahead, and and people will file in behind you. Yeah, and it's interesting. One of the questions that I did want to ask you today, Tim, was around that conviction, but more to the point around how do people get started. But I think you've really just highlighted that it's find what your true passion is for advisor for an advisor. Learn what you can, get external help or collaborate where you can, and then have yeah. the conviction to move forward. Yeah, I mean, there's no shortage of people out there that can help you. I think that was one of the great things that when I spoke to that life coach back at that time, she's a smart businesswoman as well, and I was saying that these are the things I want to do in the business. One of the great bits of advice she said is don't reinvent the wheel. Don't try and de- design something that someone's already got. <laughs> they've already they've already solved the problem, and all you got to do is go and pay them a little bit of money to deliver it to your clients. Don't, you, you'll spend five years trying to design something. And I don't know if it's specific to advice, but I see a lot of advice businesses trying to do that with CRMs and, you know, yeah. largely the engagement process under the cover looks somewhat, the you know, in terms of appointments taken. It's, I think the time, as you've articulated, Tim, the time and energy should be spent on what's your brand of advice and yeah. how you build trust and engage clients as opposed to everything else that sits outside of that. And I think with those types of things, like uh, things that you're going to test or try in your business, test them and move on quick. Either yeah. go, yeah, that worked. Let's let's do it. Let's, yeah. let's really lock that in. It didn't work. Let's ditch it. Mm. We 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 like to focus on wins and learnings. 
There are no losses. <laughs> it's we. It's wins that lose. It is true. Yeah, and I that I got that quote from Dane Swan. Like it or not, but oh, I it was, I like not a Collingwood supporter, but I like wins and learnings. What a, what a growth mindset way to look at things. Well, through through my retail days, uh, I worked for a few retailers, and um, one of the ladies I worked with closely at Aldi, she went on to be one of the head people at Costco, and um, uh, Costco is very American company, and she always says to me, at Costco we don't have problems, we have opportunities. <laughs> So she, she says that does her head in at times, but but it is true. She she says you know, it's a, it's a, it's about um, finding those opportunities to to do something different. And I reckon I reckon that's a fantastic note to finish up on, Tim. Thank you very much for your for your time today. I again, Nova, I really enjoyed the conversation. Yeah, I applaud, I applaud your bravery and you know where you're taking your business. So thank you very much. Thanks, Ryan.